<laughs> Someone moved on the subcommittee, not a. Uh, it's a working group. Okay, right. working group, not not not, not a supervised a, group. No, it'll it'll be okay. a couple of people. We don't. We can't. I'll volunteer to be one. Right. We can't have too many members of the committee. Um, we can only have two members. Yeah, we can't have more than two members. Yeah. Okay. Yeah.
Good morning. I'm David Ferriero, Archivist of the United States, and it's a pleasure to welcome you here for the first meeting of the FOIA Advisory Committee for 2018. The end of this term of the FOIA Advisory Committee is rapidly approaching, and I want to thank the committee members for generously lending your time and expertise to this effort. This committee is charged with looking broadly at the challenges that agency FOIA programs face in light of an ever-increasing volume of electronic records and charting a course for how FOIA should operate in the future. I understand that your three subcommittees, Search, Proactive Disclosure, and Efficiency and Resources, were very busy over the last year and that, com that this committee has a number of recommendations to consider and vote on today. And I look forward to receiving your recommendations and the committee's final report during your final meeting on April 17th. Before I leave um, you to your deliberations, I'd like to take a moment to invite you all to join us for a special event during the afternoon of Monday, March 12th, celebrating Sunshine Week. This is an annual nationwide celebration of access to public information. Since the American Society of News Editors launched the initiative more than a decade ago, it's been embraced by journalists, librarians, civil society organizations, elected officials, government employees, and concerned citizens as an opportunity to discuss the importance of open government and its impact. It is an initiative that the National Archives proudly embraces, and I'm sure that OGIS will keep you up to date as the program and partic participants are firmed out. Before I turn the program over to Alina, I want to recognize and thank OGIS's Deputy Director, Nikki Grayman, for her service. After serving as an important part of OGIS's leadership team for the last five years, Nikki will be leaving us later this month to serve as the new FOIA public liaison at NASA. And during her nearly five-year tenure at OGIS, Nikki served as acting director during two different periods when the office was without a director, and in that capacity, represented NARA in front of Congress and served as this committee's chair. Please join me in thanking Nikki for her service to NARA. And as I warned her, she's still in the FOIA community, and we will be in touch. <laughs> Thank you all for your hard work. I look forward to reading your recommendations and final report. And I'll turn you over to Alina. Thank you. Great. Thank you, David. Good morning, everyone. Uh, and thank you again for joining us for today's quarterly meeting of the FOIA, Federal FOIA Advisory Committee. Uh, we have some uh, folks on the phone participating. Some, some of you are watching us via live stream, and some of you actually braved uh, the colder weather and the impending snowstorm to, to come out in person. So thank you. As the Director of the Office of Government Information Services and this committee's chair, it is my pleasure to welcome you to the William G. McGowan Theater and the National Archives and Records Administration. This is, believe it or not, the seventh quarterly meeting of this 2016-2018 committee's term, and it's our second to last meeting, um, so we're in the home stretch. Um, as you all know, members were appointed to this committee by the archivist and were tasked with collaboratively developing consensus solutions and recommendations that will be sent to the archivist and which address some of the greatest challenges related to the FOIA process. Earlier this year, we all agreed on a very ambitious schedule of target dates in order to ensure that the committee has enough time to fully consider all of the recommendations resulting from all the hard work of the subcommittees. Um, thank you all for embracing this challenge. Um, I want to thank you all for your enthusiasm, all the time and effort you've devoted to honing and uh, fine-tuning all the recommendations. And I'm very excited to talk about all of that today. Uh, I especially want to thank our six uh, subcommittee co-chairs who have been instrumental in guiding the subcommittee's work and keeping momentum moving forward. And uh, you'll hear from each one of them later in the meeting. Uh, I also just want to thank Nikki, um, who does not necessarily like to be called out, but she has been um, a wonderful asset to the FOIA community and to OGIS, having served as the deputy director for almost five years. And uh, we are very excited for you as you begin this new chapter in your life, but we're really going to miss you. So thank you. Uh, we'll also be calling you a lot. So. So we have a number of recommendations to get through today, no speakers, so that's good, right? Um, so I want to be sure we have enough time for our deliberations. I would try to move things along 
Um, we have some administrative things to go through first, though, house speak, housekeeping rules uh, and a review of our general agenda, and, and I'll set some expectations for today's meeting. First, uh, let's introduce all of the committee members participating today, uh, both on the telephone and those who are sitting around the table. Uh, let's begin with those members who are on the telephone. Hello, Sarah Kotler. <coughs> uh, hi, this is Sarah Kotler from okay. FBA. Great, good morning. Uh, do we have Lynn Walsh? Hi, this, this is, is Margaret Polka from the University of Denver. Oh, hi, Margaret. And this is Chris Knox from Deloitte. Hi, Chris. This is Lynn Walsh from the Society of Professional Journalists. Okay, great. This is James Vabel with Cause of Action Institute. Hi, James. Uh, do this we have... Sean Moulton with Project on Government Oversight. Do we have Logan? Going once, going twice. Okay. Uh, James Hirschberg. Doesn't sound like they're able to join us right now. If they join us later, please chime in and identify yourselves so we can make sure we note that you're coming in a little bit late. Uh, let's begin with, and Michael Bekesha, is he, he's on his way. Okay, Michael Bekesha will be joining us shortly. He is, he will be sitting right there. <laughs> Uh, let me begin with the folks who are sitting around the table. Uh, let's start over here with David. David Pritzker, Administrative Conference of the United States, and on temporary detail to the Consumer Financial Protection Board, Ombudsman's Office. Stephanie Carr, Office of the Secretary of Defense, Joint Staff. Uh, Michael Bell, Department of Health and Human Services. Ginger McCall, Department of Labor. Tom Sussman, public member. Melanie Pastey, Department of Justice. Raynell Lazier, um, Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. Lynn Jones, National Security Archive. Jill Eggleston, U.S. <coughs> Citizenship and Immigration Services. Okay, and um, this is our DFO, Amy Bennett, who, those of you who don't know, <laughs> Uh, thank you for all those introductions. Just, I want to remind everyone, I always have a hard time remembering this myself. Uh, make sure you identify yourself by name every time you speak. It helps Amy keep better minutes, um, meeting minutes. And uh, also, let's also remember this. This I'm also very bad about this. There's a slight delay between the time that uh, members are going to be talking on the phone and then when the speakers are turned back on in the room. So just pause, look around and then speak. Uh, so let's go on to administration. Uh, as everyone knows, this committee provides a forum for public discussion of FOIA issues and offers members of the public the opportunity to provide their feedback and ideas for improving the FOIA process. We encourage the public to share their written comments and suggestions with the committee. To learn more about submitting public comments to the committee, please visit our newly updated website. It's not so new anymore, but it's still exciting. Uh, www.archives.gov backslash OGIS. You can also provide committee, uh, the committee with feedback by emailing FOIA-advisory-committee at NARA.gov. I believe that information is behind me. At the end of today's meeting, we will have a time for public comments, and we look forward to hearing from any non-committee members who have thoughts or comments they would like to share. And we are also monitoring the live stream, so if you have any comments, you may submit them and we will read them uh, out loud during the public comment period. To promote openness, transparency, and public engagement, we post committee updates and information to our website, our blog, and on Twitter at, at FOIA underscore ombuds. Uh, stay up to date on the latest OGIS and FOIA Advisory Committee news, activities, and events by following us on Twitter. Uh, information about the committee, including members' biographies, committee documents, and public comments, are all available on the OGIS website. We are live streaming uh, the meeting today and we'll make a video transcript and meeting materials available on the committee's webpage as soon as possible. We uh, generally expect meeting materials to be posted within approximately 30 days. Um, thanks for hanging in there while we, well, before we post. Uh, we are going to take one 15 minute break today as we normally do. Uh, hopefully it'll be around 11.50 a.m. If we're making great progress, it'll be earlier. Uh, during the break, you may wish to purchase food or drink from the Charters Cafe located on this level. As a reminder, there is no food or drink allowed in the auditorium. 
Um, please note there are restrooms directly outside of the theater and another set downstairs near the cafe. Um, so during our last meeting in October, uh, the three subcommittees offered a preview of their recommendations to the committee and gathered an initial feedback. Uh, in the intervening months, uh, everyone has been very hard at work and uh, working to further shape and refine uh, our, uh, our recommendations. And today we are going to further discuss, finalize, and vote on each of the subcommittee's recommendations. To begin our discussion, I'm going to ask the subcommittee co-chairs to briefly discuss the substance of their recommendations. I will then open up the floor to the committee for a brief period of general comments. And then after general comments, we will entertain specific suggestions for edits. Uh, Amy is prepared to sit, um, stand up at the lectern and type away. Um, so that everyone can follow along, we will be displaying the text of those recommendations and the red line edits uh, on the screen behind me. Uh, after discussing suggested edits and reaching an agreement on the text, we will vote on the recommendations. In your, ha in your folders, we've included uh, handouts uh, outlining our voting procedures. For members on the phone, the procedures were included in the email from Amy last week. Uh, briefly, any member of the committee can move to vote on a recommendation. The motion does not need to be seconded, although it seems like that's what we've been doing. <laughs> so we could continue doing that. Um, the vote can pass by unanimous decision, uh, which means every voting member, except abstentions, uh, is in favor of or opposed to a particular motion. General consensus, which uh, is at least two-thirds of the total uh, votes that are cast, or a general majority, which is a majority of the total votes um, on a motion. Uh, in the event of a tie, we will reopen discussion and the committee will continue to vote until there's a majority. So we might be here all night. Just hang in there. After this meeting, the approved recommendations will need to be combined into a comprehensive final report on which the committee will vote during our final meeting of this term uh, on Tuesday, April 17th, 2018. Um, so here, drum roll please. At this time, I'm going to ask for any committee members who would like to volunteer for a small working group to help prepare and finalize the committee's final report. I will volunteer, Ginger. Okay, wow, okay. I didn't expect such great uh, yeah. Michael enthusiasm. Bell as well. Michael Bell, thank you. David, thank you. Uh, anyone on the phone? Nate is volunteering. Okay, we're trying to keep this to about six people at the most. You can kick me out. I'm not <laughs> kicking you out. I'm just letting the folks on the phone know. Anyone on the phone interested in participating in the working group? Yes, okay. Elena, this is Chris Knox, I'll help. Okay, thank you, Chris. All right, anyone else going once, going twice? So our working group is Ginger, Michael, David, Nate, and Chris. Okay, thank you very much for volunteering and we'll be in touch about logistics afterwards and we'll figure out a way to, to move forward that's logical and most efficient. Um, so I am now going to turn my attention to the October 19th approval minutes. Uh, and I think everyone has had a chance to review them and all comments have been received and incorporated. Um, I have certified the minutes, so I will now entertain a motion to approve the minutes. So moved. Thank you. Do we have a second even though we don't need it? Second. Thank you, Ginger. Um, all in favor? Aye. 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 Uh, all opposed? Okay, the minutes have been approved and will be available for public inspection on the committee's website. Uh, so before we get into the subcommittees, um, I know Melanie wanted to share a, a few comments before we get started and I will also add a couple of my own as well. Great, thank you. Um, I'm obviously happy to be participating in the discussion today, but I wanted to let the committee members know that because um, some of the recommendations that we're talking about directly uh, are directed to OIP and certainly the totality of the recommendations concern the work of OIP, OIP will take no position on the recommendations themselves, so I'll be abstaining from the votes. But I, and I wanted people to know that right from the beginning. But what I do look forward to is receiving the recommendations and the report at the end and incorporating that in our work going forward. Um, I do want to add especially that I think the, the topics that have been addressed by this advisory committee, the proactive disclosures, finding effic 
finding efficiencies using technology are all areas that OIP has been looking at for some time now. We've issued guidance on many of these areas, had practices, best practices and training, so we think these are all incredibly important. And I think that the work of the um, FOIA Advisory Committee has been particularly useful and helpful um, to have help form a common understanding between our non-government members in particular and the government members about the issues and challenges connected with those topics. So I think in that sense, this has really been a very, um, a very productive and fruitful adventure. Um, and as I said, um, but because of the connection with our work, I'll be abstaining, but really do look forward to uh, reviewing everything when it's finished. So um, I just want to add before we get started, I found myself in a slightly similar position to Melanie to the extent that we have some subcommittee recommendations that ask the archivist to make recommendations for OGIS to take certain action. I do find it a bit of a conflict since I am also uh, the director of OGIS as well as the chair of this committee. I uh, will respectfully abstain from those OGIS specific recommendations. Um, but we'll be happy to vote on, on the rest. And we'll see how the voting goes, whether we do it in a bundle or separately, we'll play by ear. So um, thank you for that opportunity. Um, so any questions before we get started? So we're gonna hear first from proactive disclosures since um, they never seem to get enough airtime. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, Margaret and Sarah, are you planning to, are you taking turns introducing the recommendations? How do you wanna proceed? Margaret. Um, I think that, yeah, we've divvied them up and I'm going to talk about two of them and then Sarah's going to talk about two of them. And if Sarah doesn't mind, um, I, if I could go first, uh, I've got a six hour time difference from you all now. And at some point my children will show up. So um, <laughs> if I can, if I can get through um, to the bit that I'm going to introduce first, that would be helpful. Is that all right, Sarah? That is fine. Right, great. Um, so the two um, can I jump right in, Alina? Are we good? Yes. Yeah. Okay. I'm going to take that as a yes. Um, so the two recommendations that I'm going to introduce are the ones uh, concerning the publication of FOIA logs and um, the one that enumerates criteria, proposed criteria for deciding what materials agencies should proactively disclose. So I'll start with the FOIA law recommendation first, um, since it's a bit narrower and more specific. Um, this, uh, this recommendation, uh, which I, I introduced a bit last uh, meeting, um, flows from uh, kind of research that the committee took note of, uh, including some of my own, but many other people as well, um, that has shed light on FOIA operations um, and agency activities out of FOIA logs themselves. And then also um, pertains to the presentation this committee saw by Max Galka last uh, meeting term, um, where I think he very ably described uh, the very kind of interesting things one can learn about government and also about transparency operations from FOIA logs, um, and also the difficulty in obtaining um, kind of uh, standardized versions of the logs. And so this recommendation out of the subcommittee um, seeks to um, kind of with some specificity uh, recommend to agencies the regular publication of FOIA logs and um, a particular format uh, to the extent the agency is able to do that. So I will try to hit on the key points here and then open it up for discussion maybe before we move on to the second recommendation. So, um, so the, the first key point is that agencies should generally publish their um, FOIA logs to their electronic reading room on an ongoing basis. The subcommittee recommends at least monthly unless it's an agency that receives a really small number of requests. We chose less than 100 per year in which case uh, less frequent posting would be appropriate. Um, the second portion of the recommendation uh, delineates uh, the fields um, that should be contained where possible in order to be most useful. Um, and these are fields that um, 
uh, in our experience, are commonly kept by, and some in some cases are required to be kept by uh, the agencies by law, um, and therefore um, uh, this set of fields would, um, and also have been the fields that have uh, been most useful um, in the kind of reporting and research that uh, we uh, detailed in the background section of this memo. And then um, the third um, uh, enumerated point uh, suggests that the logs be posted uh, in a more accessible format. Um, and so uh, the one thing I wanted to highlight, and then I'll open it up to uh, any comments or questions, um, is that the subcommittee itself was uh, did not reach a conclusion on um, the question of uh, the field containing the name of the requester. Um, we were somewhat um, divided, I think, in terms of uh, whether all names should be included, uh, perhaps with the exception of first party requesters who are requesting their own records, which DOJ has taken the position are subject to privacy exemptions. Or much more, or whether it should be much more limited than that, and the names only of, for example, commercial requesters and preferred fee category requesters, so news media, educational institutions, whether those are the only names that should be disclosed, and then any um, individual requester, individual non-first party requester name would not be published. Um, the subcommittee was in broad agreement that those names that are not first party requesters are not exempt under FOIA. Um, and so, uh, but there was some disagreement about whether proactive disclosure was appropriate. And so I will put that and um, the rest of the recommendations of the committee for discussion. Okay, thanks, Margaret. Um, let me open up the floor for any general comments. Uh, I'll kick it off by asking just a question that I have that um, I noted when I was reading through the other recommendations. There, in the second set of recommendations we'll be talking about, there is also uh, another discussion of FOIA logs. So I just wondered if um, anyone had picked up on that and whether um, it should just be subsumed or whether you want to have it a standalone recommendation. I'll say that I think I, I, I saw those as, uh, as it, I saw that recommendation as consistent. Um, but I, I see value and our committee saw some value in having a standalone recommendation about the logs because of their potential to shed light not just on you know particular government actions but on FOIA operations as part of improving uh, FOIA as giving us more data that we can work with as we look for uh, other kinds of improvements. Um, I, I welcome the views of the rest of the committee on that question. Um, I, I would just reiterate my position on, I understand that it's a bit of a tricky question on whether requesters' names should be published in FOIA logs. My position that I told the subcommittee, and I'll say it again, and I'll, I'll be happy to be overruled, is that the status quo should stand. I don't think that the FOIA Advisory Committee should be less transparent. And the, the status quo now, generally, is that requesters' names are published um, unless it is a first-person privacy request. And I think that it is beneficial. We saw uh, Max Galco's presentation um, last session, um, and we would not have had the insights from this data uh, with, without that information. So I personally um, have made my view to the subcommittee that I don't see a reason to roll back um, this releasing this information from this is Nate. Thanks. Question. Jill. This is Jill Eggleston. Uh, Margaret, you said to the extent practical that uh, the information that the subcommittee has recommended be included in the FOIA log. So I am assuming that um, if an agency does not track or um, have easy access, I guess, to the information that you recommend that you're not recommending that the agency be required to, um, you know, take on, I guess, the obligation to um, modify a system or 
do special queries in order to report that information? Margaret, did you hear the question from Joe? Margaret, are you still there? Hi, Alina. I think you are the only person I can actually hear, so I have not oh. heard the previous comments. I'm I sorry, apologize. Joe was asking a question. I'm yeah, this is Sarah. Well, I couldn't hear any comments in the room either. I don't know if, what, if the people are just, if it's a microphone issue or what. Oh. Joe, would you mind asking your question again? Sure. It's on. Could you just speak directly into it? Okay. Uh, let's try again here. So um, my can question. Can you hear her now? Um, we can just hear you. Okay. Yeah, talk in my mic. I'm happy to pass it. Okay, this is Jill Igolston. Um, my question had to do with um, a comment that Margaret made. She said, to the extent practical that agencies would be required to provide uh, the information or the fields identified in the logs. And so I guess my question is um, just to clarify to the extent practical. So in other words, if an agency didn't have the ability or didn't currently track that information or it wasn't um, readily available to the agency without, um, you know, contracting out uh, services to run special queries. I'm assuming that the subcommittee not, would not require the agency to take those extra steps in order to get the information. Thanks, Bill, for your comment. I heard you this time. Thank you. Um, so uh, we had this discussion in the subcommittee, and um, and I, your characterization, I think, accurately reflects what we intended, which was that, um, to the best of their ability, that this would serve as a, a guide for agencies about what fields are useful to publish and should be published where they can, um, but that in the event that an agency um, does not have the data um, available within some reasonable means. And therefore, we, we phrased uh, number two, part two of the proposal to say, in order to be the most useful agency logs should contain, um, but, but backed away from uh, perhaps a, a stricter language of must, you know, um, at all costs contain or something along those lines. But I, if other members of the subcommittee have differing views, please feel free to weigh in. No, Margaret, I agree with what you just said, Sarah. Okay. Thank you both. Um, anyone else want to comment on this recommendation? Okay. Does anyone have any specific edits that they would like to make to the recommendation? Amy stands ready. Literally. <laughs> Literally. Yeah. Oh, David, I'm sorry. Go ahead. <clears throat> well, um, I, when I read what's currently written for 2C, the name of the requester, uh, I'm not in favor of advising that all requesters' names be listed on the log. And so I would, and to, say, to word it so that uh, something like, in order to be most useful, FOIA logs should contain each of the following fields, and then under C, name of commercial requesters and those in preferred fee status, status category, period. To, say, to identify those that should be posted on the log is not to say you can't post anything else, so that wouldn't undo uh, the status quo that, that Nate referred to. Okay. Thank you, David. Reactions to David's particular edit that he would like to make? I know Nate has already 
gone on the record to say more globally, it should be third parties should be released. This is Margaret. I would just quickly. Now in my individual, not uh, subcommittee co-chair capacity, I will agree with Nate that I, I would prefer um, C to say the name of third party requesters. Um, there has been no case law or DOJ guidance or any, um, any other authority that I'm aware of that has ever uh, considered that there is any privacy interest in simply the name of the requester um, without, you know, any of the data that we might, you know, as, as individuals making requests, you know, otherwise want to protect, like, our addresses or contact information, which is not included in any event. Um, and I have found those names can be very helpful, especially because um, people sometimes don't list their affiliation, but if it's a, you know, well-known reporter, reporter or, um, you know, uh, something like that, you can often tell what their affiliation is. And, you know, if a, if a request is a short request and there's not going to be a fee charged anyway, sometimes people won't, um, the affiliation might not might not come with their name in the log and um, or get, might not get reported and therefore um, the names can be quite useful in that regard. And for individuals who don't have any public persona, at, at least in my experience, you can't get that tell much, tell much from the name anyway. Um, and so it doesn't it doesn't really have um, much much impact in my view. Okay, Margaret, thank you for those comments. Um, anyone else want to comment on, on David's proposal? Uh, I just have a brief comment. I'm, uh, Stephanie from DOD, I believe that most agencies uh, already take into consideration the fact that uh, there are first party requesters and they take they don't release those and release all others. and to have us to do something different would make us less transparent than we have been. Uh, yeah, <clears throat> this is Tom Sussman. Uh, I agree with Nate. I think the status quo is important. Uh, it does seem to me that perhaps uh, agencies ought to be urged uh, or directed to make clear in their websites where they provide FOIA procedures that they are going to make names of requesters public so that, frankly, if a requester wants to use a cutout or a lawyer or a, a, a FOIA you know, a, a firm, they can do that and maintain confidentiality, which is perfectly acceptable under the process. Okay, thanks, Tom. Anyone else want to make any individual comments, either in reaction to David or any of the other proposals? David, a reaction to uh, your own th comment. Th there, ha there have been references to th uh, limiting this to third party. I don't see that phrase anywhere in here. I can't see that over there. Amy, have you added third party? Yep. Okay. All right, would that satisfy? Would that satisfy your concerns? Okay. Yeah. All right. Uh, any other comments? Do are we ready to vote on this yeah, particular? Oh no, we're not ready to vote, David. Com comment on one more thing. In yeah. D organizational affiliation of the requester, and I thought I heard Mark would say something like, "Well, sometimes you can figure it out," or, uh, but that might be entirely irrelevant if somebody knows. The request, if, if the agency is familiar with who the requester is, but it is not part of the request, not identified, seems to me that's inappropriate to include. Okay, thank you for that comment. Anyone want to react to that? So you you want to you want to strike how about it? Adding uh, at the end of D, uh, um, some limitation. Um, uh, if pertinent, comma, if pertinent to the request. Okay, reaction to that comment? I, I think 
the thinking was, just on background, uh, not Margaret will know better than me, but often to get preferred fee status, uh, requesters have to say their affiliation. So I think that's where it comes from. But yeah, but th then it would be pertinent. Then it would be. Uh, this is Jill Eggleston. What if we were to say organizational affiliation requester if identified in the request? Yes, yes, that, that's fine. Okay. That's good. Thank you, Joe. Anyone else want to comment on that? Everyone else okay with that change? Okay. Nate, you're okay. Anyone on the phone have any other thoughts or reactions to this uh, final edit that we just made in D to D? Going once, going twice. Okay. Are we ready to vote? Alina, are you yes. asking are we going to vote on email. which proposal for C? I did too. No, I was actually going to ask know. for the they whole the proposal. I know. I, I don't think we have an agreement, though. The way it's written right now is that we have an or um, on name of requester. So most of the, the comments were um, that that, um, that people were happy with the name of, the, of all third-party requesters, and then also noting that the agency should alert requesters that they will publish the names. Um, but then David's proposal was that <clears throat> that we should say um, publish the names of commercial requesters and those in, pre in preferred fee categories. Right, but so I, it's not limiting. Right, so but I thought actually David conceded to just saying third-party name of but, requester. Well, I'm, I'm not sure that th th that phrase is inserted in the right place. Okay, I'm sorry. I can't. That's too small to read. Thank you. Oh, yeah, thank you. So, David, are you okay with us cutting? Oh, that's too big. Now. There's a certain there's a certain amount of explanatory uh, phrasing in this for the benefit of our, our consideration now that really doesn't belong in, in right. the final text. So are you okay with cutting the part that I have highlighted right now? Is everyone okay with cutting that, the explanatory part? The, uh, starting with note, right? Oh. Oh. So are we going to insert and see name of third party requester? Okay. And the rest of the note is going to be deleted. Yep. It is. Yeah. Okay. I'd, I'd make the word name, second line of C, plural, names of all third party requesters. Yeah. Yeah. That's good. That, that looks good. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Any other comments? Any line edits we need to make to this recommendation? Everyone good? All right, are we ready to vote? I'm very excited about our first vote. Amy, are you ready to tally? Um, okay, so do I have a motion to uh, accept for the vote's approval for um, the, uh, the first uh, recommendation regarding FOIA logs that we've just finished discussing? Ginger, so moved. Thank you, I don't need a second, but I'll take it. Thank you, Tom. Um, all in favor? Aye. 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 Uh, all again, oh, what about folks on the phone? We can't he really hear you. <coughs> yeah. Yeah. You yeah. Yes. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. It's hard to hear them. Uh, um, okay, anyone against? Please say nay. Anyone abstaining? Yes. No. Okay. Thank you, I believe that passed. It's probably the most painless one. All right, good job, everyone. Pat on the back, right. All right, let's keep going. Uh, Margaret, are you going to talk about the next one or is that Sarah? Can you hear me? We can hear you. Great, okay, yes, I'm talking about uh, the next one, which um, 
I'm going to move on to the proposed recommendation for proactive disclosure criteria. So uh, the subcommittee's thinking on this recommendation was that um, one useful contribution we could make would be to provide agencies with um, a set of criteria or a framework for deciding what records that wow. they have should be proactively disclosed. Um, and so in doing that, of course, the memo outlines some background legal requirements, um, various sources of hard and soft law that, um, that govern agencies' decision-making on proactive disclosures um, to date. And um, from that drew two broad goals um, that those, um, that those uh, uh, principles have, have been trying to advance. And those objectives are basically to allow access to agency documents that memorialize agency actions that affect the public, and then to preempt the need for FOIA requests to the extent possible, so to make available affirmatively that which the public is most interested in. Um, and so, um, and then I also, uh, the memo also that details um, some of the other ways in which agencies already decide to release information proactively, so various public concerns that they take into account, um, and the memo details various examples of those. Um, and so uh, that uh, section really documents how agencies already, in many ways, um, attempt to publish records that, um, that uh, the public will have the most interest in, including um, government-held uh, data in various ways that um, the public might be concerned. So the proposal in part three um, has uh, three parts. Um, the first part um, seeks to um, further the core objective of allowing public access to records that memorialize agency actions taken pursuant to their statutory mandates. Um, this gives examples, but that's not exclusive. Uh, this, this part of the recommendation also lists various considerations that agencies might take into account when deciding whether a certain category of record um, is, uh, is amenable to proactive disclosure. Um, and then, uh, so including, you know, necessary review and redactions um, weighed against the benefit to the public. The second category of records um, are records that provide original government collected or maintained data um, about anything in the world. So this is kind of like scientific data, census data, other things that, you know, the government regularly publishes, but many agencies hold data sets um, that could be useful to the public um, and they should consider publishing. So this is kind of in line with many recent um, or now not so recent government initiatives um, like data.gov um, and things like that. Um, again, this, this part of the recommendation attempts to outline the kinds of considerations that agencies would use to decide whether uh, a particular uh, data set was uh, ripe for proactive disclosure. And then the third is about frequently requested records. Um, this goes beyond the statutory mandate currently in the reading room provision of FOIA, which states that an agency should publish any particular record that has been requested uh, three or more times under FOIA. This um, takes that statutory uh, starting point and recommends that agencies go one step further to publish categories of records that are frequently requested by the public. Um, to the extent that it is uh, feasible given other considerations which are also listed in this recommendation. And so those three broad categories, which I think um, the committee viewed as in line with uh, the proactive disclosure um, requirements and um, initiatives of government in the past, but seek to advance the ball in each of those three areas uh, somewhat. And so I will open it up to committee comments. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Margaret. I really appreciate it. I heard someone beep in. Is there someone else that's joined us on the phone? Or perhaps someone that dropped out and came back. Okay, no one wants to own up to it. All right. Um, any general comments about uh, this uh, recommendation?
Okay, anyone on the phone have any comments? Very quiet. Okay, do we have any specific line edits that anyone would like to offer uh, on this particular recommendation? Again, very quiet. Well, well, you've noted the, that uh, there's a reference here to FOIA logs, which right. we've already dealt with. There's no point in having it a second time. That was my. That was a question that I raised. Yes. I think it might I can be an issue for that the, the that draft. The oh. Right. We could just defer to the working group. Okay. Not having hearing um, any other concerns and any individual line edits nor general comments. Uh, are we ready to vote on this particular recommendation? Well, under, under J, there, there's some indication of variance of opinion within the subcommittee. So perhaps we should address that. I think that's on the other one. David, I think oh, that's on the we're other. We're looking at it. I think what's up there is different. Yeah, we don't have a J. I think Amy, you're looking at the other recommendation that's just to front and a back. It's much shorter. Oh, yeah. Margaret was talking about the one that is dated 11618, yeah, proposed this, recommendation for oh, proactive this disclosures. One, Amy, yeah. Criteria. Yeah. criteria date. Disclosure oh, criteria oh, date. Oh, I'm sorry. That's okay. Okay, we have a, a motion from Tom. If we're ready to vote, everyone ready to vote? Give me a chance to sit down and tally. Um, okay, all those in favor um, of this particular proposal from the subcommittee on proactive disclosures, recommending specific pro proactive disclosure criteria. Um, all in favor, say aye. 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 Okay, uh, anyone opposed? Say nay. Um, and anyone abstaining? Yes. Okay. I think we've passed that one too. Two down. All right, Margaret, is is uh, is it Sarah's turn now? Yep, sure is. Thank you. Okay. Thank you so okay. much, Margaret. Thank you, Margaret. Um, I'm going to start with the proposed recommendation for agency proactive disclosure priorities. It's the one that's dated January 11th, um, 2018, and it's just a front and a back. Um, and this lays out how our committee came up with the categories that we are um, recommending for proactive disclosure, one of which was the FOIA logs that we, that was also the basis of the first recommendation that Margaret discussed more in depth. So we will get to that one, but just um, to set forth a summary of our methodology, we kind of brainstormed on a lot of possible ideas for types of records that could be proactively posted. And then everyone on the committee um, ranked these categories of records based on the ease with which agencies would be able to post them, or on the other hand, the difficulty and the importance of posting them. And everyone gave their own sort of subjective viewpoint on these different categories, and then we spent a lot of time discussing um, what the priorities would, priorities would be based on those rankings, and, and Amy did a lot of work making sure that that was all <laughs> recorded. So thank you for that. So um, we tried to focus on types no, of records. No, no. We, we tried to focus on um, types of records that were somewhat cross-cutting so that they would apply to a lot of different agencies and not be something that might just apply to one or, or two. So I will go on and just list for you what we came out with as the, the final list, um, the first of which is FACA committee materials, and we have noted that uh, we are aware that there are already requirements for making certain FACA-related material proactively available that um, we would be recommending that additional or related records similarly be made proactively available beyond what we are already required to post under the law. 
The next category would be unclassified reports provided to Congress with the caveat that these may well need to be redacted. Um, employee directories, and there's a note that that might be overburdensome and if possible, even just a phone directory would be the minimum to be provided. For record schedules, frequently requested records under FOIA, and again, we realize that there is already a requirement under the FOIA to post records, um, and this would be that we, this would be an idea that we would recommit to this goal as well, and then to the extent there's other changes to that policy that may happen, we would commit to that as well. Um, statements of administrative policy and enrolled bill memoranda, documents of lobbying activities, FOIA logs, which we've discussed in depth, mm -hmm. calendars for our top officials, contract information, which we can get back to in a minute, just because that's one where there is an open question. Mm -hmm. um, and then the last one, which was declassified information. For example, um, Department of State make it a priority to highlight newly declassified material that was withheld from the foreign relations series. So we can, unless there's questions on, on one or more of the others, we can go back and discuss the open issue on the contract question, which was one that we debated in our subcommittee um, a lot in terms of both the number of contracts that we would make public and dollar amount what we've got in the proposal is the top 10 contracts, task orders and grants measured by dollar value and all contracts, task orders and grants valued at more than $100 million. But as you will see from the note, there was a lot of discussion about whether 10 was the right number or something higher and whether $100 million was too high. Um, so we wanted to get some input from the group on that. Okay. Great. Thank you, Sarah. Just a point of clarification. I know you mentioned you were looking at a version that was dated January 11th, and ours is the 16th, but it's the same, right, Amy? Yes. Yeah, we're all, it's, the date is, um, uh, is so something we can disregard, but the content is still there. Thank I'm you. Sorry about that. No, that's okay. I just wanted to clarify that. Uh, any general comments about um, Jay? Joe is shaking her head no. <laughs> Any other comments on this side? Any comments on the phone? It seems the subcommittee is looking for some specific feedback as to is 10 the right amount, the top 10, and is 100 million the right amount? Who knows, is, maybe after all our back and forth and discussion, we came up with the right numbers. Yes, silence is golden. Okay, I'm not hearing any oh. disputes. I'm sorry. No, hi, this is Sean Moulton with uh, Project the Government Oversight. I just wanted to uh, remark on the, on the contracts uh, stuff. And so the, the idea there and, um, was that uh, agencies would, would post, at the very least, their top 10, even if they didn't have anything over 100, 100 million. Uh, but if they had more than 10 over 100 million, then they have to post all of those. So it's kind of a... And either or um, is, is the idea of that recommendation. And uh, as said, we went through some different numbers, um, and uh, this, is what, this is what we came up with. I, I personally would love to see the dollar value be a little lower, but um, there are a number of agencies that when you start adding up task orders, their contracts get, they have a number of contracts that go over 100 million. So uh, it's at least a good place to start. So, Sean, just, I guess I'm going to ask, this is Alina, I'm sorry, I've been not identifying myself. This is Alina with a one working mic. The, um, do we want an and or added to Jay? Is that what you're suggesting? I, I think it's fine if we, if we want to wordsmith it, but I mean, I, I, I wanted to clarify in case it wasn't the, um, uh, that we had it as an and, uh, so it's, Top 10 contracts is sort of a minimum, and anything that goes over 100 million, even if it's more than 10. So, but if, if people would prefer it worded differently, that's I think that's fine. But it's uh, that was okay. the gist of what we were getting at. 
All right, thanks, Sean. Michael. Yeah, this is Michael Bell. I, just, I think an or might change the meaning of what we had written because ah, then if, okay. say, you only had one contract over $100 million, then you wouldn't have to post the top 10. Okay. So I think the and is proper in that place. Okay, thank you. All right, any other comments on Jay? Is everyone comfortable with the top 10 and 100 million as is the, is the numbers? It seems like you guys did hit it right. Okay, any other general comments on the rest of the recommendation? I do have a question. Yes. Sarah, and I guess I'll need your mic again. Or Sarah, can you hear me? A little bit. Okay, I'll just try to speak up. This is Jill Eggleston. Um, just wanted to ask, um, that this recommendation would not require an agency to create a record that it currently doesn't already have, correct? I would agree with that, since one would not be required to release such a record under FOIA um, if it didn't exist. So I, I don't know that we could require it to be proactively posted. Great, thank you. Stephanie. Uh, I just wanted to state for the record that DOD would be unable to comply with item C because we have a list of names policy and we would not post on our um, website the names of and contact information for DOD personnel. Well, perhaps that's in addition to the one caveat about burden, that might have to be something that gets added in mm -hmm. as another exception. What, what is the justification? Is it a privacy issue? Yeah. Safety. After the event, safety issue, after the events of 9-11, uh, that became the policy at DOD. This is Sean with POGO. Uh, I was wondering, uh, do you think that the, the DOD would be able to post information about uh, contact information for offices, like the name of an office and how to get in touch with them, a main phone number or a main email uh, without identifying individual personnel? Uh, that's something we could look into. I mean, I, this is Sarah, and I don't work at DOD, but I would have to imagine that DOD's website must have some kind of contact information tree that would, you know, allow that, whether they're organizational charts or something. There must be some way to figure out who people are at DOD. Yes, we do have, we have names up there, and we have, um, we have the names of public spokespersons and contact information for public spokespersons. This is Ginger. Um, I don't know if my mic is on. There we go. Uh, I am, if Department of Labor does in fact publish employee contact information for just routine low level employees, I am unaware of that and I would find it very troubling if this were a recommendation that we were making. Um, especially when you're dealing with employees who work in the contracting area, they are going to be just buried by potential contractors trying to contact them. Um, routine agency employees who work in a particular office are going to be buried by commercial contractors who want to try to get an in on a contract. This is going to take up a lot of employee time, getting root, just random contacts from the public. I, I don't think that this is a recommendation we really want to make. I think that it's one thing to say that the agency should be publishing a directory of their offices and contact information for every office, but publishing contact information for every single employee is, I think that that would set a troubling precedent and would end up wasting a lot of employee time. Okay, thank you. David. Uh, I, I'd like to, to suggest an amendment to this one. Um, I don't understand how, if it's a great burden, to furnish email addresses, it's any less of a burden to furnish phone numbers. So my, my suggested amendment is to have the second sentence read, if for any reason an agency is overburdened by this requirement, contact information for individual offices should be provided. Yeah, I think that's great, David. Thank you, this is Sarah. This is this is Ginger again. Um, I would like to propose that we change this recommendation to eliminate conversations about employee directories and contact information altogether and instead 
perhaps require agencies to put up an org chart and contact information for each office, including a phone number and email address. Well, what, what if it's not I can tell you we're part of HHS, this is Sarah, and we actually, HHS has this directory on their website for everyone in HHS, um, whereas it would actually create a new burden on us you have to, I mean, we do put org charts up, organizational charts up, but I'm sure you know the constant challenge of keeping organizational charts up to date, um, unless you meant like very general organizational charts. Is there a way for people to sort of choose which one so that they don't have to, if they've already got one of them satisfied, they don't have to choose the other one and then do that? This is Ginger. I think a general organizational chart would would be enough to satisfy what I think should be in this recommendation, but uh, I'm interested to hear what others think. Uh, this is Tom Sussman. Uh, general organizational charts already required uh, to be uh, made public and published for every agency, so this wouldn't add to that. Um, my recollection is one of the reasons the Freedom of Information Act was initially passed was in response to agencies, I believe the Defense Department was named, refusal to provide uh, their employee phone directories to the public. Um, last I looked, even Labor Department employees are paid by tax dollars and are supposed to serve the public. And the idea of feeling that they're somehow going to be burdened because they're going to be contacted by the public, um, I, I understand they may not want f phone numbers for everybody, or they, most agencies that I call rolls over to voicemail and says, we'll call you back anyway, uh, which is you know, I, I'm sort of used to that. Actually, they say, we'll call you back in 24 hours, but they don't. Uh, but in any event, I mean, I, I don't know this, this whole, this is sort of foreign to me, this whole notion of somehow keeping people who work for the government in, um, you know, in the shadows. This is Ginger. Um, I think that that's true, but I think for any customer service organization, you know, if you need to get in touch with Comcast. Comcast has a host of people that you can get in touch with. If you need to get in touch with the Target Corporation, they have a customer service hotline. They're not going to publish the names and contact information of every single employee because I think most corporations recognize, and we as the government should probably recognize, that to have everyone be open to contact by every member of the public who might have some free time and a telephone or free time and a computer, would potentially waste the time of people at the agency who do have other jobs to do. And especially when you talk about personnel who are involved in contracting or personnel who are involved in offices that have a lot of contracts. You know, I've been contacted by people in the public who want me to give names and contact information of folks in our CIO's office. You know, it, there's a reason why that contact information isn't necessarily up online because those people would be overwhelmed with contractors and and other members of the public contacting them. Uh, this is Tom. This is Tom again. It, se it seems to me we do have some empirical basis for determining whether they would be overwhelmed. I, I thought I just heard a few minutes ago that HHS has its directory public and online. I, I wonder whether the employees are overwhelmed with phone calls and, I mean. They are, I, 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 do I remember, you, you said service personnel. I thought that's what government employees were. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's hard for me to say what the burden is because as the FOIA officer, of course, my information is, is online. Um, so I can't measure what the burden is, particularly with respect to the example you gave of people in the contracts office. Now, we do get FOIA requests on a fairly routine basis for the names of the people in our contracts office and anyone who owns a credit card. And we release that, who, or who has a credit card for the agency, and we release that information under FOIA, um, you know, because we have to. So, you know, from my perspective, and also obviously unlike people who work at Target, you know, we are public employees paid, whose salaries are paid for with tax dollars. Um, so I, I see Tom's point, that's that I do understand in certain situations, particularly like the one at the Department of Defense, that there are legitimate reasons. For instance, we have a directory, but the names of our undercover agents are not posted in it um, because there is a safety reason for not including their names in it. So I certainly can see that exception that, that is not covered in the way the proposal is written. Um, and that's why I thought that David's proposal gave enough wiggle room so that if 
individual names, if there was a reason individual names couldn't be given, that there was at least some legitimate contact information being this is, given. This is Ginger. Um, I, I think if you want to release individual names, that's fine. Those are already up online. But I, before we make this recommendation, I think we would have to do more investigation. I mean, also for email addresses, I think that we would need to talk to agency information security folks, because if you're releasing everyone's email address, that opens up a bunch of possibilities for potential spam and phishing attacks that could create security flaws for agencies. I just think we need to investigate this more before we make this recommendation. We need to have a better sense of what the burden would be on the agencies that's created by this. This is Melanie. We've mentioned DOD uh, employees having a safety-related uh, reason for not having their identity disclosed. And, of course, we also, all the law enforcement uh, off, offices and then com agencies, um, you know, have really long-standing recognized protection uh, by the courts for their employee names, again, for safety. So it's, it's um, DOD uh, law enforcement personnel, I'm sure national security personnel, intelligence community. intelligence community. So there's several categories of employees who are public servants and taxpayer uh, funded, um, in taxpayer funded positions, but courts have, have had no trouble recognizing that they have a privacy interest in their safety, of course. I'd like to change my previous suggestion in view of what has been said. Uh, I suggest now that the second sentence should read, <coughs> excuse me, if for any reason an agency is overburdened by, <coughs> by this requirement or a security concern is applicable, comma, contact information for individual offices should be provided. A little broader and to not just make it security but leave the idea that there could also be just like a more general in some situations a more general privacy whether it's security slash privacy because i don't know that you could make the argument that every single employee at dod that their contact information is a security i don't know what the burden would be to should there was a like security risk if depending on what they do there but perhaps we just don't want to make it so narrow you, you don't think the introductory phrase, if for any reason, encompasses that well, reading? I was afraid that the word security might be a little limited, that that would be the only reason. I mean, there could be other reasons we're not thinking of. Again, this is Ginger. I'd like to register my strong objection to this. I think that it requires more investigation, especially if we're putting hosts of email addresses up online. I mean, imagine you're someone who's trying to conduct a phishing attack on an agency. Now, let's say that there's a machine-readable spreadsheet that has every employee's email address. You're going to take that spreadsheet, you're going to turn it into a simple little program script, and you're going to hit every single employee email address. You really only need a couple of people at the agency who aren't particularly savvy to click on your link so that your phishing attack is successful. I think that this is a very problematic recommendation, and before we make a recommendation like this, we should conduct more investigation and think more about it. This is Tom I, I'm Sussman. I'm curious. Uh, most organizations, including government, have rather standardized email addresses, and so this notion of uh, it's okay to know their names, but you won't, don't want to post their email addresses. Uh, my machine-readable computer could generate email addresses that would be 90% accurate because some people have a one after their name or <clears throat> or a middle initial that you know that others don't use. But, I mean, email addresses are not that difficult, and we subscribe to, to directories online that I think provide that information right now. Uh, leadership directories, uh, federal agency directories, the courts, the Congress. Um, you know, th this information you can buy, so I'm not sure, and these, most of these firms that sell it to you keep it up by making phone calls, by connecting, by FOIA requests, and things of that sort. So, I mean, why would we make it more difficult for the public to get this information than for those who can afford to buy it? Um, this is just Nate Jones with a question. Does, what's the policy at National Archives for email addresses posted online? Yeah, I'm fairly confident we release um, that information, yeah. We're very transparent at the National Archives. Well, I, I ask because generally NAR is a transparency leader, so I think from my world, I said whatever NARA does is a good um, 
position to follow. That's fair. I'm just, um, I know Tom, no, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm, no, I, I would be okay, I mean, it seems to me that, that Ginger's suggestion that we not necessarily reach a conclusion on this item today, but uh, there, there is empirical information which, which we could learn more about. Um, you know, I think we know some now, Nara. One thing is, you know, three requests for the information that you'd have to give us anyway, and you'd have to post it. So it, it, it may be that there are a series of, you know, points and counterpoints that could help educate us a little better between now, do we, I don't know if the timing is, if, if there's a problem, but I mean, I would be prepared to vote on everything but C and hold that for the, perhaps the first item of our next meeting. Yeah, I was actually going to suggest that as an option. Um, I was also trying to think of language that might uh, provide a solution, and I was looking actually to K, where we start the phraseology with, to the greatest extent possible. I'm wondering if we could use it here as well, to the greatest extent possible, employee directories and contact information, including email addresses, period, um, and just delete the rest of the caveated language. So this is Tom again. If we do that, I would still add the sentence that David suggested, the second sentence, that uh, because if it's not possible to do individuals, then still the office and contact information needs to be made public. This is Ginger. I, I think if we're going to say to the greatest extent possible, again, I think this does bear more investigation before we make this recommendation, but if we want to get a consensus recommendation for the day, I think that if we're going to say to the greatest extent possible, we should also flag the potential security and privacy concerns so that whoever it is that's implementing this, which may not have any conversation with the, with the CIO's office, for instance, they may just implement this without necessarily even thinking about security concerns. I think we should flag that in there. That would be a responsible thing to do. But again, I think the better thing to do would be more investigation before we make this. Perhaps make a broader recommendation about employee directories and organizational charts and contact information for particular offices. Um, but this sort of recommendation is something I think would require more investigation. Okay, thank you. Um, let me just ask Sarah and Margaret, are you willing to carve out C um, to try to move forward on the rest of the proposal? Um, I don't know if Margaret's still on the phone. This is Sarah. Okay. Um, I mean, I am. If, if there are people with concerns, obviously security is a very important concern, and it sounds like even putting in language makes clear that this is in some cases not required. It seems like Ginger's concern is that this almost shouldn't even be encouraged, even if people were willing, even if agencies were willing to do it. Um, and since I don't profess to be an internet, an IT security person by any stretch, um, and I don't recall that we had that conversation in our subcommittee, though anyone who was there can, can jump in and correct me, I don't see the harm in, in just making sure that we're not inviting some kind of harm that we didn't anticipate. This is Ginger. I do want to say I could potentially be won over on this if we do further investigation and it turns out that agencies are already doing this with no negative effects. I just think it wouldn't necessarily be responsible for us to make a recommendation without first investigating the potential ramifications of that, of that recommendation. Okay. Um, so, Sarah, since Margaret's not on, I'm going to ask you as a remaining subcommittee co-chair, would the subcommittee be willing to undertake that kind of investigation? So we can discuss it further at our next meeting. Yeah, I could talk to Margaret about how we would do that, but I, I will discuss it with her. Okay. So I'm, I'm, how this much is of an in investigation would we conduct? Uh, we, we've already heard from two major agencies today that don't have a problem with it, and we've heard that, uh, from two, two others that they have a problem. Mm -hmm. uh, what sort of investigation would we do? I this is Ginger. I think it would be helpful to talk to some people who actually know about computer security, especially about releasing all of the email addresses. I just think that that's a useful piece of the investigation. Um, and you know, I don't know what labor does. I, I honestly don't don't know what what most agencies do. So I think if we could ask around to other agencies, maybe talk to someone who knows about computer security, that would be helpful. Um, I, I wouldn't. This is Sarah. I wouldn't be surprised to see a distinction because I know just in FOIA responses, we at FDA 
release the names of our employees and their email addresses, except in very limited situations like undercover agents or some other very specific sensitive situations. Whereas I know from getting referrals and consults from other agency, other agencies, it's very typical, even when releasing emails under FOIA, to take out the email addresses of any employee. Um, and I've never entirely understood that. So my guess is that perhaps those agencies that won't even release an employee f email address under a FOIA request are the same ones, hopefully, who wouldn't put it up on their directory now if they're not releasing it under FOIA, but it's up there in a directory that's a little odd. Um, and they're going to have to figure out why they're doing what they're doing. But this has been something that's been a bit of a distinction for a while that I've seen. Yeah, this is Ginger. I know anecdotally, at least at Labor, we do not release low-level employees email addresses and work phone numbers. Um, if it's I'm a higher level appointee, phone. we do. So there, there is a, a distinction there between a higher level employee and someone who's, I don't know, a relatively low level attorney like myself, for instance. Right. And some agencies like mine, we don't make that distinction. If you work at FDA, your email address is out there with very, very few exceptions for security reasons. So it may be useful for us to then investigate if there is a distinction between agencies. Why are some agencies not releasing these email addresses and phone numbers? Because there are some real, there could be some real policy reasons uh, that justify that lack of release, and we should know about that before. If we're going to make a recommendation, I think being responsible about it and doing that sort of investigation beforehand is necessary. Okay, I guess my question is, do you really want to upset that apple cart? If there are agencies who are currently not releasing that information due to their policy, um, you know, and we were, David suggested language that would have sort of given agencies the ability to be consistent with whatever their policy was, now we're going to go look into it and do you want to, and, and see what we find out and, and, you know, that could change things for people down the line. I think if we're going to caveat the language enough, then that could potentially be something that's satisfying to at least me. I don't know how others feel about this or even if anyone else has an objection to it. Um, but I think as long as we're willing to caveat the language and, and make it nuanced enough, then I could potentially agree with this. Then do you want to just discuss that language now? Uh, yeah, I mean, I'm, ha I'm happy to discuss that. So David, did you want to reiterate what your proposal was? Uh, yes, um, the, the, the first sentence I would not change un unless we want to, well, thinking aloud, uh, someone pointed out the opening phrase of K, to the greatest extent possible. So here's my, here's my current proposal, uh, that C should read, to the greatest extent possible, employee directories and contact information, including email addresses. Second sentence. If for any reason an agency is overburdened by this requirement or a security concern is applicable, comma, contact information for individual offices should be provided. Is that something people can live with? I, I am a little concerned about the suggestion of more investigation because we, we have a, something of a procedural problem with the committee, yes. uh, that decisions need to be made in public session, and if we don't have a final text uh, by the next meeting, uh, what are we going to do then to get well, the final text? So to, to respond to that, actually, there is the backup plan is we can have another meeting between now and April if we have disagreement on some of the other recommendations. But um, I want to hear from Amy, who I think had a editorial suggestion. Uh, so to reflect that um, it was both a security and a privacy concern, I think that we were hearing from, from Ginger and, and others, we could say a particular concern, for example, security or privacy is applicable. Yeah. Uh, I, I haven't said it before, but every time the word privacy crops up, it seems to me that that'll swallow the whole the whole uh, recommendation. I just don't understand any government employee that wouldn't assert that he or she has a privacy interest in keeping the public from connect, from contacting her uh, during the working hours. And I have just the opposite view. I think that that you know that there shouldn't be privacy if there's not a security safety, you know, or or you know, uh, law enforcement. I mean, I'll list all of those. 
but if it's just a personal concern about not, have, not having being bothered by the members of the public during working hour, I would object to that. Well, what if this is Sarah? What if we keep Amy's idea of saying, for example, security, but not adding in the word privacy? Like, do you feel a need to list everyone security just in the, on the off chance that we're not thinking of some legitimate you know, finite list? Worry me a little bit. Um, I understand that maybe the word privacy is not a good one in that in that case, but something like, um, for example, security or something like that. And then it's clear that we need a, a specific reason. That's fine. Uh, this is Ginger. I would leave privacy in there because here's what these words do. They ensure that the person who's potentially implementing this policy actually consults with the privacy attorneys and the CIO's office in the agency. These words are a flag that indicate that, that a particular office should then be consulted before a policy is rolled out. Um, I would change the language here, if this is just me again, uh, to the extent possible, employee directories and contact information, and I'd cut the including email addresses. But that's just me, because I just don't think that we've done enough investigation to really make these sorts of, of recommendations. Uh, but I would definitely leave privacy in. Because again, as much as Tom may object to this, I, I know particularly at Labor and as we've discussed some other agencies, we do believe that government employees do have some extent of privacy in their contact information, even, even work contact information. Because Ginger. we routinely redact out those email addresses. Um, this is Raynell. Um, I, I'd just like to say that, can we acknowledge that um, folks, the public, everybody's still gonna be able to get this information without this um, recommendation? Um, so I'm wondering if it's probably best to just leave this out and rely on E, um, rec frequently requested records, rely on the fact that we have an obligation to post our um, org charts and other uh, supplementary information already. Um, and then where this becomes an issue, just have folks submit um, a general FOIA request where they're interested in it. Um, I think, I don't know, um, I don't wanna, you know, kind of attack what the committee's accomplished, but maybe if we leave that out, then we can go forward with the rest of it, um, if you're comfortable. This is Nate. I'd actually be more comfortable with tabling it, studying it, um, and then either voting yes or no, I don't really want to have another meeting. But uh, I think if, I, if there, I, I think that, um, I think that it's a valid question. I mean, I know Congress generally puts their emails online. Some agencies generally do, some agencies generally don't. I don't, personally, I don't want to say, I'm not ready to say that it's a bad idea. Uh, or that, it, I mean, we're proactive disclosure. I don't want to say that you have to do FOIA right now. This is Ginger. I'm also not ready to say that this is a bad idea necessarily. I just don't have the information that I would need to evaluate that. Um, and as I'm the person who's being a pain here, I would be happy to volunteer to help gather that information. Um, For the I, record, you're not being a pain. I, <laughs> I'm the person with the strongest objection. I would be happy to, to volunteer to help gather that information and do that work that's necessary to, to gather the information. Uh, I'd like to try one more edit to this. Okay. And then maybe we'll wrap it up uh, because we've got a lot more to, to replace talk the about. word particular with significant and change the uh, because everything is a particular concern and replace the IE with an EG. Uh, do, do we have a way to adopt this tentatively? and reconsider it if investigation along the way suggests a change is needed? No, I think it's, I, I think from a procedural standpoint, it's probably cleaner to either carve it out and vote on the rest or vote in with whatever language we're, we're hearing. I, I mean, I'm hearing generally um, consensus for tabling C for the time being. I'm seeing nods, shaking. Um, should we go forward? Let's carve out C for the time being uh, with Ginger's wonderful volunteering because she has nothing else to do. Um, you'll work with Sarah and Margaret to give them some feedback. Uh, we'll figure out a way to communicate what that feedback is to the whole committee in a, in a public fashion. And then um, maybe we can either work out language um, or it just we'll move forward without it. 
Are we prepared to vote on the rest of the recommendation, uh, carving out C, and moving on with the rest? Are we dropping H? Okay, I have a, I have a motion from Tom. Uh, are we dropping H? Uh, let's just have a cross-reference there. Yeah. 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 Right. Yeah, I think the vote was not to not to drop it. So can I can I have a vote on the recommendation without C in it? So uh, moved. Thank you. Uh, and Tom did too. So we have two movers. Um, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Um, all um, opposed, please say nay. Okay. Um, any abstentions? Okay, one. Thank you. All right. So um, I'm trying to move things along because we actually have a lot more to get through. Um, but good discussion, everyone. Thank you. Uh, I think there's one more recommendation from the Proactive Disclosures Subcommittee, right? Sarah, is this you? Yes, it is. And, and I wish it, I could say it's something that I think won't generate a lot of interest to discuss, but I don't think that's true. Um, so I don't know how you want to handle that. It's about 508. Um, and it's the document called Recommendation to the FOIA Advisory Committee on Proactive Disclosure and the Rehabilitation Act, Section 508, um, dated January 16, 2018. So I can run through the document, um, but, you know, being mindful of the fact that we don't want to monopolize this entire meeting, you can decide how you want to proceed with that. Um, this is a separate um, issue that we are recommending to the archivist to do um, several bulleted items that I will try to run through quickly, which would be to launch an interagency effort to develop standard requirements for FOIA processing tools to ensure that the tools and their outputs are compliant with Section 508, to encourage agencies not to remove documents because they aren't compliant. We would encourage remediation rather than removal, um, but would discourage removal in any event. Um, request that OGIS conduct an assessment of the methods undertaken by agencies to prepare documents to post on agency FOIA reading rooms. Encourage OGIS to highlight the issues of proactive disclosure and 508 compliance in its report to Congress by recommending that legislation be enacted to clarify agency requirements under the Act. Recommend that agencies conduct an undue burden analysis by balancing Section 508 and our FOIA obligations. And then, in summary, agencies should already be creating 508 compliant documents before they are ever requested under FOIA or proactively posted. Agencies should develop requirements for FOIA processing tools to ensure both the tools and their outputs are compliant, and agencies should not remove these documents um, when they are not compliant. I realize we could probably talk about this for three days. Um, so I will leave you with that. Okay. Sarah, thank you very much. Uh, does anyone have any general comments? Sure. I do. Of course. Um, thank you, Nate. Well, I think and also, let me say if Nate or anyone else from the committee wants to jump in on this, please feel free. Sure. Uh, I think, um, this, so this was a recommendations that were under drafting during the last meeting. Um, so just part of the thinking, um, and our first meeting as a FOIA advisory council, we had some people from the access board come, and I think from my from the minutes that I read, two of them said no, never take documents off the website, and one of them said yes, take documents off the website. <laughs> so it shows that it's unclear, and as a FOIA pro transparent person, I don't want documents down. Uh, it's also topical because actually, um, according to recent reporting, 92 documents on climate change were just taken off uh, National Park Service website, and the reason cited for this was they were not 508 compliant, and at last I checked, they had not been put on. So, so it's important. Um, and then just, just the general background, and then we can hash through the specifics. I think there's, but you can trust that the subcommittee spent a lot of time trying to make these work, and I, and I think they do. I don't, I, I look forward to your comments. Um, but I just want to say, for the record, my position, and I think the position of the subcommittee, is is absolutely reasonable for documents to be OCR'd um, when they go on a reading room. Um, it's, that's, it, it makes it easier for everyone. Um, if an agency misses a character or has a typo, I don't, I don't think that's the reason not to post a document. It should still be posted. Um, the real problem is this example of if a document has a picture of a clown in there. The, what some people say is that some government employee has to go through and type in picture of a clown juggling in the document. That, I don't think, in the grand scheme of things, is reasonable. 
Um, what is reasonable is to use the words of the Rehabilitation Act that say that when there is an undue burden, agencies can post the documents online anyways. So th what this recommendation essentially does is, in my opinion, say some common sense stuff and point out uh, what the, how the law should actually act. I think it's needed because I have not seen on OGIS or OIP kind of say this. Um, and I, I think this is a good start and gets it moving, but I look forward to um, discussing it. This is Ginger. I have a question just generally. Does Section 508 create a private right of action? It does. Okay. So is there potentially an issue here where if we're telling agencies not to take down non-compliant documents, we're actually opening them up to litigation? Well, the, la the language actually says encourage agencies. Okay. But we could, if, if this is adopted, that could open agencies up to litigation uh, and I mean, liability. I think lots of things that the FOIA Advisory Committee could recommend could do that. It, it, it's possible. Um, I think you'd have to, I, I, the language that encourage agencies not to remove documents already posted on their website, I, I'm, hap I'm happy writing that whether or not it could open up agencies to, to litigation. Uh, but what we would be encouraging agencies to do here, just to be clear, would be to be out of compliance with the law. No, nope, that's not my understanding. No, I th I, this is Tom Sussman. Uh, I, th I think we actually, some of us pressed to make the recommendation that agencies uh, err on the side of uh, posting. Um, and we were, I think, convinced in the end that we shouldn't be giving legal, legal advice and so, but we do stress the undue burden uh, part without trying to uh, explain exactly what it means because the courts have never clearly explained exactly what it means. And as, uh, as we heard, the, the people from the access board w weren't terribly clear about what it, all this means. And so the idea, I suppose, uh, of suggesting that the um, Freedom of Information Advisory Committee should opt in favor of more information getting out it shouldn't be surprising and I suppose an agency could be sued if it doesn't let names and addresses uh, out um, of, of its employees so we wouldn't be encouraging litigation if we accepted uh, uh, those from proactive disclosure. I mean, I, I, anything we recommend, uh, there are people who are going to sue and so I don't believe that that's a reasonable objection. But Ginger disagrees. So, I mean, I don't necessarily disagree. I'm just trying to understand the calculation that we're making here. The, the calculation that we're making in this encouraging agencies right. not to remove documents already posted on their websites because they may not be Section 508 compliant. So these are documents that may not be compliant with the law, a law where there is a private right of action and the agency could potentially be sued. What is our justification for encouraging that? It's just openness as a policy matter? It looks really bad when the United States government takes documents off of its websites that are actually still up there anyway. Um, and it looks even worse when the FOIA, the FOIA advisory um, board's subcommittee on proactive disclosure, uh, our biggest effort is giving more information to the public balancing, but in the end, um, I wouldn't phrase it as just openness, I would say letting the public have access to its information. Um. I mean, I think the rest of this is great, and I definitely agree that we should be making a recommendation that 508 not be in conflict with FOIA. But the issue is just if we're ensuring, if we are encouraging agencies to potentially not be in compliance with this law, that's problematic. I, I just... I think that we can ensure a re we can encourage a reconsideration of this potential conflict between 508 and FOIA, but I don't know if we want to encourage agencies to do things that might lead them to not be in compliance. Um, I hear your point. I don't see it that way. I don't see it. That, I don't believe that we're encouraging agencies not to be in compliant with 508. This is Melanie. I, I guess I just want to this want to just comment that it. In a way, like just, it might be helpful to think of this happening in the reverse, a 508 committee saying, 
Well, don't don't worry about FOIA. Our, the only thing, the main focus here should be 508. I mean, any we you know, no no one should be put above the other. I, I think the two laws are intended to work together. In fact, when you think of it, 508 is designed to make sure that everybody has access. So it's 508 compliance is enhancing of transparency. It's not it's not pulling back on transparency. Well, I certainly transparency. see what you're saying, but in the specific case, 508 again and again specifically is cited to not post documents online. So when we have this potential release to one, release to all policy, agencies are saying we're not going to do that because of 508. So I, in a perfect world, yes, but in the real world, they are at conflict. And I don't want to talk for the 508 advisory committee, but I suspect they're putting the interests of 508 and ac accessibility above the interests of FOIA. I think that's good for them and good for us. Um, this is Ginger. I I think that the rest of these recommendations strike the right balance that we would encourage a report to Congress uh, on squaring the legislation, that we would encourage agencies to conduct an undue burden analysis. I mean, I think those are really excellent recommendations that strike a good balance, but I mean, my concern about private rights of action and potentially encouraging agencies to be out of compliance with the law remains. I, I sure. just think that I that's problematic. And I can't in good conscience say that it's, I can't uh, vote for something or I don't want to, I personally would vote against taking out a simple statement saying don't take documents off websites. So. I, I don't know well, we, we, this is Tom. We do encourage them to remediate yes. w when they're on the website. And I suppose, uh, I'm, I'm just wondering if there's a compromise in there that we could say leave them up while you are remediating that way that's a good compromise uh, or if okay. there's an undue burden don't take the it, it, if you if you can demonstrate an undue burden don't take the documents down while you work on remediating I mean that I think is fine um, this is Melanie I just I just want to say you're still giving it's still you're making a legal judgment that that's okay to do I, I, I would I flag that well, it's the same so, so are you telling me that every agency now with documents up there that are not accessible is violating the law have you made that right. legal decision right. see I, I'm what I'm saying is I really think it's it, it's we saw from the the uh, presentations that we had from 508 how complicated this area of the law is. So I would be the last person to think that we should be opining. I wouldn't want to make a judgment as to whether something's 508 compliant or not. And I think I'm, I'm just raising that point for the benefit of the committee that the committee might likewise not want to wade into that uh, because Lane. here, here too, this is gender operationally is what might happen. There might be a particular agency employee that sees these recommendations and decides that they're going to implement them. And maybe they don't talk to the attorneys that would be able to make a better call on 508 compliance. And we're making this recommendation. I, I just think, I don't know, operationally, I can foresee a scenario where the the proper people aren't necessarily consulted before this policy that we're recommending is rolled out. I mean, and you could say that about any recommendation that we we're making all day today. I mean, we're. But this is one where we're explicitly saying there's a law you may not be in compliance, and we're sure. encouraging agencies to continue to be in non-compliance. Well, I think we should. Uh, I would suggest, for the interest of time, we should either see if there's a middle road, uh, I, or we should have a vote. Um, Amy, I was going to make an, <clears throat> an editorial suggestion that maybe we can, you know. Um, get around this issue by removing the reference to because they are not section 508 compliant. I think it's absolutely true that you know this subcommittee throughout all their discussions have said that their primary point is that they don't want agencies to remove documents from their websites. So if we take it out of the, the first sentence, um, we then still have a point about you know that we encourage agencies to remediate documents and then we remove it um, at the bottom here where it says even if the agency, even if the information posted is not fully compliant, um, then we're still getting to the heart of the recommendation without specifically saying that, you know, we have, you shouldn't take them down because of 508. And what was just this? Where is the bottom? Um, so right here. And I, I, I would add to Amy's suggestion to put in boldface the second sentence there as part of the recommendation. But 
uh, it, it strikes me that, that this is very different from saying to an agency, it's okay to post non-508 compliant uh, documents. Uh, this says if you've already posted it, the, uh, the, the governing principle should be don't take it down, but try to fix it. And by, by emphasizing the second sentence, uh, yeah, um, <laughs> we may have to work a little bit with the syntax of this to, to make it fit. But uh, I think that the two suggestions together would, would be, I hope, an acceptable middle ground. Uh, take it out of the, take the reference to 508, compliance out of the first sentence and emphasize the second one. This is Ginger, oh, sorry, go ahead. Sorry. Uh, Jill Eggleston, I would suggest that we take out the word nevertheless. That's this part is, of what I had in mind when I referred to fixing the syntax. Yeah, I think we should also take out the end of that sentence, even if the information posted is not fully compliant with Section 508 of the Rehabilitation Act. So we're editing it to say, encourage agencies not to remove documents already posted on their websites. We encourage agencies to remediate documents that are not currently 508 compliant, documents that have optical character. Recognition are also much easier for all individuals to search through and utilize. We discourage the removal of information from agency websites that is useful to the public. Agencies should ensure, et cetera. I think that's the right balance. It discourages taking information down, but it also doesn't necessarily encourage potential noncompliance. I, I can live with that. Don't love it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I, I was... Tom Sussman, I was about to throw out the question. I, I, I see the difficulty of acknowledging that they're not compliant and saying they should be left up. Uh, but given the uh, uncertainty that everyone acknowledges as to whether something is compliant or not, because it is compliant if it would be unduly burdensome to make it accessible. And so uh, perhaps just instead of because they may not be compliant, because there is a question whether they are compliant, or something that to, that acknowledges that there may be doubt. I mean, that, and suggesting that, although I'm okay, I'm okay taking out references completely. I suppose that I that's a that's a punt. Answer, that's an yes. easy punt. So, Amy, would you mind just reading out loud what the sentence, the two first sentences, are going to read? Sure. So everyone can hear and we can know what we're voting on. Encourage agencies not to remove documents already posted on their websites. We encourage agencies to remediate documents that are not currently 508 compliant. Documents that have optical character recognition are also much easier for individuals to search through and utilize. We discourage the removal of information from agency websites that is useful to the public. Agencies should ensure that their FOIA reading rooms include contact information that individuals with disabilities can use if they encounter inaccessible documents. Okay. Seems like generally. How about making bold the rest of the, of the second sentence? Oh, can you please bold the second sentence? Mm -hmm. The rest okay. of the second, yes. All right. I know this has uh, engendered a lot of discussion. And anything else in this whole proposal that um, needs to be commented on? Anyone have any other general comments they'd like to make? No? Any individual edits? All right, so um, I'll take a vote. Can I have a motion? Vote. Nate, are you moving? I move. Okay, um, so let's take a vote. All in favor of this proposal from the subcommittee on uh, proactive disclosures, please say aye. 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 All, uh, all uh, against this recommendation, please say nay. Do we hear the folks on the phone? I don't think, I don't you, think you do, no. Okay, can I... We are trying to comment. I'm sorry, can you say that again? I think maybe oh, was there... I'm comment. sorry, be, were you guys trying to comment? Someone who was on the phone. Jim Hirschberg, do you want to go? Yes, I would like to express my strong agreement with Nate's comment uh, about the principle that information or documents should not be removed from websites uh, that have already been posted uh, due to issues concerning 508. Uh, I'm fine with the compromise 
that we okay. certainly would uh, discourage any removal or non-posting of information, uh, it being understood that you know all reasonable efforts to increase um, availability would be made. Also, as one of the few historians on the group, I just want to stress that this is very important for historians because historical documents are not always easily um, uh, made uh, available uh, for 508, but this should, again, not discourage posting of documents or materials. Okay. This is Melanie. I just wanted to point out for this, for Amy, the in the summary paragraph, it repeats that. I think it's like the third sentence from the bottom just needs the conforming edit. Thank you. It's got that language about Right. The Agency should not remove posted documents. Period. Period. Okay. Any other comments from folks on the phone that we missed earlier? I apologize. So, but one, one suggestion, this is Jim Hirschberg again, should that line be expanded to say not only agencies should not remove posted documents or refuse to post documents or important documents, uh, you know, prospectively? That's an entirely different conversation, yeah, I exactly. think. Yeah. David? I, I, too, was going to point out that we needed a correction to the last paragraph. Mm -hmm. And what I would suggest is that the sentence under discussion say, agency should not remove posted documents from agency websites, comma, but should take, but should undertake remediation where needed. How about where needed and feasible? Yeah. Or, 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 or not causing undue burden. Amy, did you get that suggested at it? So, um, David, this hopefully gets at the, and of course, as a member of the working group, you can play around with the wording uh, as, as you like after, after this meeting. Um, but agencies should not remove posted documents, but should undertake remediation where needed and feasible. I think you wanted to leave in from agency websites in that first sentence. He just wanted to strike that, websites, that do not comply with Section 508. Right, David? Okay, so let's try this again. Any other comments on the phone? And I'm sorry, I did not mean to ignore anyone on the phone. Okay, any other comments from the table? I move for vote. All right, thank you for the motion. Uh, let's take a vote on the so um, cr uh, recrafted uh, Section 508 compliance recommendations from the Proactive Disclosure Subcommittee. Uh, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 All, those in, uh, all those against the recommendation, please say nay. Uh, all those who wish to abstain. Here. And I'm going to go on the record, I'm abstaining with regard to the two OGIS specific recommendations. I am in favor of the other ones. So I'm looking at the time and I know I was trying to go into, I was gonna to try to get in efficiencies and resources subcommittee presentation next, but I'm wondering if we should take a break because um, it is 11.53. Let's come back at uh, 12.03. No, that's not right. Math is but not good. 12.08. Uh, so we can resume our deliberations and we'll get through the other two subcommittees on um, on the tail end of this. Okay, so thank you very much everyone break Just remember the mics are still on
nice talking to you. It was nice talking to you. No, 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 no. Okay, I need you. You're my first one.
I mean, if you request the directors, we probably, I mean, the, oh, right the directors right. would probably yeah. be released yeah. anyway. I say directories. Directories, I mean. That's fine. Absolutely. If you want to request them, you can, but I can pretty much guarantee you that the names of low, the, not names, but the contact information for the low-level employees isn't going to be included. I mean, I know we routinely redact. It's like, ask everybody your brain processing, for instance, do this in Google Docs or something. Low-level employees. Direct okay. line. Okay. Exactly. This is exactly the same way, and it was more painful. I mean, also a lot. While labor might not seem like a law enforcement agency, but they do. Yeah, no, I know several of our components are. Yeah. Yeah. I worked on the Hill also for 12 years where every expenditure is public, every cent of your, your salary is all public, your, you know, name and address. And Yet they're not subject to FOIA. Hmm? Yet they're not it's subject to FOIA. Well, it doesn't, well, they don't have to be. I mean, if you, you know, the, the agencies that are subject to FOIA don't give you that much information. Well, this, no, the, it Congress, depends. Congress, the FOIA wouldn't have passed when Congress was in session. So. Yeah, Yes. <laughs> Smiles, everyone. Okay, can I have everyone take their seats, please? We're going to get started again. I'm trying to stay on schedule. I know we have uh, two more subcommittee recommendations to go through. So hopefully everyone had a good break. Uh, f folks on the phone, do we still have you? Yes, you I'm it's Sarah Kotler. Okay. Thanks for hanging in there. So I'm going to turn it over now to Ginger and Chris to talk about the proposals from the Efficiencies and Resources Subcommittee. Uh, just to direct you to the handouts, they have a, a neatly outlined uh, set of proposals that have charts. They're very helpful. So over to you, Ginger and Chris. I don't know uh, who's doing I'll I'll be covering part. it. Chris is on the phone. Um, so first I want to thank Amy who went through the painstaking process of making these charts 508 compliant. Um, <laughs> I'm going to attempt to be very brief here, but feel free to subject me to the same level of scrutiny that I have been subjecting others to. Um, so I'm just going to read our recommendations, uh, but you can see that there's another column within that chart for benefits, and there's also a section above with our observations. Um, just to review, the way that we came to these recommendations by, was by surveying agencies and also looking at OGIS assessments. So that information about our observations is included in the section above each recommendation. So recommendations. Uh, first, under the broad heading of management of process, our first recommendation is to advise FOIA offices through best practices to work with requesters early on to clarify requests when necessary. Our second recommendation is to promote collaboration between employees to ensure coverage of cases during periods of leave and peak times. Uh, and then we're also recommending that uh, teams are formed with common strengths to handle particular types of requests. Under the subheading of accountability, we are recommending to introduce case closure, pages reviewed, and quality requirements as part of employee performance evaluations, and to track status of requests for records, ensure visibility of overdue requests, and establish protocols to handle overdue requests. On the expanded use of tracks subheading, we are recommending that agencies prioritize requests using separate tracks, simple, complex, and expedited, and assign resources accordingly. 
and that agencies encourage simultaneous processing of simple and complex requests so that processing of either category is not unduly delayed. Under centralization, to the extent possible, uh, our first recommendation is, where appropriate, centralized processing. Um, and then under the heading of bringing in talent, uh, our first set of recommendations is on the subheading of building a career path. Uh, for that, we recommend consider creating rotational programs to expose young employees to FOIA and create a career model for information management. Under the subheading of interns, detailees, and contractors, uh, we are recommending that agencies assign interns or temporary staff to complete straightforward time-consuming tasks such as data entry and that contract surge support staff uh, are used to increase responses rapidly and aid in routine review. The next heading is using technology to improve the process with the subheading of records management and search. There we are recommending that agencies create add-ons to IT systems for exporting records, that agencies designate a point of contact to approve search requests within records management systems, and that agencies make the end goal of responding to FOIA requests a major component when developing the records management system and workflows. Under the subheading of tracking systems, we are recommending the adoption of a centralized department-wide FOIA tracking platform or, or that agencies alternatively consolidate, consolidate to fewer tracking systems where possible uh, to leverage an established I'm, I'm forgetting what this acronym stands for commercial. in the moment. Uh, government off-the-shelf or commercial off-the-shelf product uh, across the organization. Um, and if a commercial off-the-shelf product does not meet the agency's need, contract a developer to create an in-house system and have a developer on standby for updates. Uh, so those are our recommendations. Um, and I also want to turn it over to Amy briefly to talk about a specific um, practical solution that we've been talking about under one of these recommendations. So, so thanks so much, Ginger. Um, the committee members might remember during the last um, the last meeting, it was noted that um, when FOIA offices sometimes have a hard time contracting for FOIA support uh, because there are a lot of contractors uh, and it can be very difficult to to find the right to find the right um, vendor and um, to go through that process, Logan Perel um, <laughs> stepped up for the subcommittee and he reached out to GSA to see if there was anything we could do with them to address this very practical problem. Um, and GSA got very excited about helping uh, agencies uh, contract FOIA support for FOIA support more efficiently. Uh, they are have already gone through a process of identifying vendors under a particular general services schedule um, that can provide FOIA support for agencies. Uh, they are going to be going out to that list again to ensure that they have the, the fullest list um, available. And then they're, we are going to be working with GSA uh, on creating a FOIA contracting page uh, that, that agencies can use so that they can quickly um, in, or as easily as possible identify the appropriate vendors uh, and um, bring that support into the agency as soon as possible. Thanks, Amy. Um, I just want to ask Chris whether he has anything to add to Ginger's great presentation. No, this is Chris. I don't have anything to add. Okay. Uh, Ginger, thank you very much. For sure. Um, I just want to open up now to any general comments on uh, this set of recommendations. Okay, anyone on the phone? Okay. Um, any specific edits to any of the recommendations from the Efficiencies and Resources Subcommittee? That's Amy's cue to go up there. Mm -hmm. Does anyone have any specific edits? This might be painless. Okay, anyone on the phone? Any specific edits from anyone on the phone? Okay, clearly everyone wants to go to lunch. Oh, I just one comment. Um, I just wanted to thank Logan again for making the recommendation about GSA, and I want to thank the members of the subcommittee. We got some really excellent edits on this, which is probably why we have less edits to do now. So thank you Thanks. to subcommittee and to Amy and to Chris. Can I have a motion? 
since I'm not hearing any other edits or comments, is everyone ready to vote? David? Yeah. Are you ready to vote? <laughs> I, I'm just looking at the copy that was distributed today to be sure that it has the last minute edits that uh, I submitted before. Okay. And, and, yeah. and do they? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, Tom, for the motion. Uh, I'd like to take a vote now. All those in favor of adopting the recommendations of the Efficiencies and Resources Subcommittee, subcommittee please say aye. 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 All those um, against a recommendation, please say nay. <coughs> The sneeze was not a nay from me. <laughs> um, those who wish to abstain? Okay. All right. That was very painless. Very nicely done. Thank you, Chris and Ginger. All right. Let's move on. Uh, we're going to hear from the search subcommittee. Last but not least. Sure. Um, so Is Logan on the phone, by the way? Logan, do we have you on the phone? No. Not, okay, so Nate, you're on your own. <coughs> sure, um, this is Nate Jones. Um, hope this is largely what we discussed in the last meeting um, with a few, um, I think, relatively small tweaks and then a couple additions, which I'll point out. Um, but uh, essentially, I, I won't take too long and we can discuss um, general comments or edits. But essentially what the search subcommittee found after um, researching FOIA searches was that um, they are a very large part of the re often a very large part of the reason for FOIA delays and they're often uh, very inefficient um, they often put FOIA professionals in a really bad spot because um, non FOIA people um, don't conduct searches well so the FOIA people can't review the documents uh, and fourth and finally um, there's not a lot of public information at all about how FOIA searches are conducted. Um, so with that in mind, here are our recommendations. They essentially fall into two pots. Um, one is a pot of action items that we uh, recommend the archivist take action on, and then another is a pot of general search recommendations that every agency should um, probably be doing that we recommend OGIS to, I, I don't want to use the wrong word, but not promulgate, but pass around, how about that? Um, so that, oh, just make sure that agencies have um, these general best practices on how to conduct efficient searches. So um, we request the Department of Justice, Office of Information Policy, collect detailed information as part of each agency's chief FOIA officer report regarding the specific methods and technologies agencies are using to search for their electronic records, including email. Potential topics um, to that that, well, there's a typo, that merit further attention include agencies procurement of technology, ability to search email, acquisition of e-discovery tools, and ability of information on agencies' website that helps requesters understand the agency's record keeping systems um, and to submit targeted requests. Um, there, as you might see, one of the suggestions last time was to more specifically state things to include in the DO in chief FOIA officer reports. Um, which actually is drawn from later on in this report, and these are, I would read them as suggested, not required. Point two, direct uh, OGIS to examine the use of appropriate performance standards in federal employee appraisal records and work plans to ensure compliance with requirements of FOIA. We further recommend that OGIS submit the results of the assessment and any recommendations to the President and Congress. Um, essentially, that is, uh, trying to amplify the DOJ's instruction that FOIA is everyone's responsibility using OGIS's statu statutory ability um, to report to Congress. Uh, third, uh, propose that the Chief FOIA Office Council seek to establish a technology subcommittee in partnership with the Federal CIO Council to study the utilization and deployment of FOIA technology across agencies and identify best practices and recommendations that can be in implemented across agencies. Um, that's a new one. Essentially, we are asking the tech people to get involved with FOIA searches. Suggest a modification to the federal acquisition regulation to require all agencies when acquiring electronic record management software, electronic mail software, and other records related information technology to take into consideration features which will help facilitate the agency's responsibilities under the Freedom of Information Act to provide access to federal agency records. That's also new. Essentially, it's saying Part of the reason that searches are 
not always conducted well is because the software isn't built for FOIA searches. So to tell the FAR, um, to require that. To recommend that the archivist um, tell the FAR that. And then moving on to the second uh, basket of um, recommendations that agencies should be following. Um, so direct OGIS to publish the following recommendations to improve the timeliness, thoroughness, and efficiency of agencies' FOIA searches. One, increase the ability for FOIA offices to procure technology to aid federal agencies in more effectively, efficiently conducting record searches to the greatest extent possible. Um, next bullet point, ensure that agency emails can be efficiently and accurately searched electronically by FOIA offices. Next, in light of the potential legal costs of untimely or inadequate FOIA searches, agencies should explore the process of obtaining software and technology tools, including e-discovery tools, to conduct more accurate and timely FOIA searches. That one was tweaked a little bit um, from suggestions at our last meeting. Next, effectively explain on agency websites how agency records are maintained and ensure that FOIA public liaisons and other FOIA personnel work with requesters to submit well-targeted FOIA requests. And that was added, I believe that was added um, due to comments from our last meeting as well. Um, so with that, I welcome any of my subcommittee members to pitch in and clarify anything that needs clarification and then welcome the discussion. General comments? On the phone, do we have any general comments? Okay, do we have any specific line edits that anyone would like to suggest? I did, I don't know if this is appropriate, but yeah. I did see a typo. typos that. Sure, now's so, the time. Well, I don't, probably enough to say that merit a, our drafting committee do a copy edit. Is that okay? Could do a copy edit. Right. Sure. This is Ginger, I have a question. A lot of these have substantial overlap with the efficiencies committee. Is part of the working group's job to, to sort of reconcile things? That was our vision, okay. that the working group would try to integrate the recommendations of all three subcommittees, and to the extent there's overlap, bundle them, address them, and, and uh, lay out the recommendations. Great. I find it very encouraging, by the way, that there is so much overlap mm -hmm. that we've come to that amount of consensus. Thanks. I agree. David, do you have any comments, line edits? <laughs> I'll second what Nate said about typos in here. Okay, thank you. <laughs> All right, last opportunity, folks on the phone. Anyone have any comments or suggestions? I, I, I do have a procedural question. Can you uh, s speak into the mic? Just make sure that everyone hears. I, 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 I do have uh, questions uh, somewhat related to the procedure after today which is to get some sense from either OGIS or from the committee as to how much of the explanatory material that these various subcommittee reports uh, have presented should be incorporated into the full committee's final report. And the, and part, part of the reason for this is that some go, goes into detail about what we heard from whom and others just talk about general principles. So, do, does anyone have I'd, any I'd, thoughts on that? I'd appreciate any, any, any uh, sense of, of the committee or from o, direction from OGIS as to how to handle that. Tom. Yeah. Uh, this is Tom. I, because of the incredible detail of note keeping, record keeping, transcripts, minutes, et cetera, there is a rich legislative history with this advisory committee. And so I think to for, for purposes of uh, uh, gaining the attention of readers that um, less may be more in the final, that is focus on the recommendations and the reasons and then, you know, go, go for, from there. I, and I was going to note earlier, especially in the um, FOIA logs, I mean, there's actually a, a lot of personal references. Margaret says, I did, you know, because it was taken from one of her memos. And obviously all of, you know, th those sorts of things we can get a much more lean final recommendation. I'm hearing Tom volunteering for the working group. Does anyone else hear that? No. Um, I, I think we can leave that up to the working group to, to talk about. We had talked about the fact that we would provide a background section, certainly 
some of the subcommittees wanted to talk about the methodology that they used to arrive at some of the conclusions that they arrived at. Um, but I'm open to ideas and suggestions. Does anyone have any other thoughts about how much or how little should be in the final report? Um, I just have a procedural question and another issue. So, um, I, I mean, I, I understand that we're abiding by the rules, but it seems uh, the rules are a bit antiquated to me. For me, it would make more sense to discuss our um, potential tweaks and whatnot over text electronically. There's no, so I'm a bit worried that we're going to do a lot of ish, a lot of uh, energy drafting this final report, mm -hmm. and then just to clarify, it's we cannot discuss it until the day of sitting around a table. It's impossible to circulate and discuss it yeah. before that. That seems inefficient, but. So my question was, is there a way around it? And I'm hearing no. Yeah, I, I don't think there is. Okay. Um, Amy? Uh, so the subcommittees certainly can, can meet and discuss. Um, we could always, um, if you wanted to suggest edits, you could send them to us, and then you know we could share them with the full committee. But all deliberations must be open to the public. Public. So if you wanted to, like how um, David Pritzker provided us with um, edits, that we were then able to share with the with the committee today, we could certainly take edits on on the full committee report and discuss those uh, at the at the final meeting. But all deliberations must be open. Okay. Would the committee be open to posting a draft on the website? Yes. Yeah. Um, as as soon we as should. we as soon as we have a draft that the working group is happy with sharing, I am happy to put that on our website. And all of today's recommendations are already on the FOIA advisory committee website. We post things as soon as, soon as possible. So, so I'm hearing the solution is for the working group to get their product done quickly, get it online, have people prepare their edits to present at the meeting. Right. And I, I, I still want to hold out the possibility if we absolutely need to, we could try to have an interim meeting. Mm -hmm. uh, I know that folks have a really busy schedule and it would be a little tough, but we could certainly try to do it um, if, if really needed. So look at your March calendars and let me know what might work. Um, okay, so back to the search uh, subcommittee. Don't want to take the spotlight away from Nate. Um, any other general comments or specific line edits? I didn't hear any. Folks on the phone? Okay, it's quiet, so I'm assuming everyone is good. Um, can I have a motion? So moved. So moved. Okay, thank you. Uh, let's take a vote. Um, all in favor of the searches subcommittee's recommendations, please say aye. 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 All those uh, opposed, please say nay. Uh, and folks on the phone, we didn't hear your vote. Aye. Aye. I guess we've lost a couple of people on the yeah. phone. Um, and um, Melanie? Abstain. Abstaining. And I, I just want to add, I'm, I will be abstaining as well with regard to matters concerning OGIS. And actually, for that matter, I have to say, also regarding the Chief FOIA Officers Council, since Melanie and I are co-chairs of that. But I am in favor of everything else, so. Okay. Um, any other homework that we want to talk about amongst uh, the committee members in terms of how we go forward? No? Okay. Uh, at this point, uh, we're just about ready to turn to public comments. Uh, I know that Melanie wanted to share some updates with everyone, um, so I will give her the floor. Thank you. Sure. I thought I would be proactive <laughs> about something that I typically get a question on in this, uh, in this uh, forum, and that's the release to one, release to all project. I don't have a, uh, a, a substantive update to give you at this point, but it remains under review, and I just continue to extend my appreciation to everyone's patience. I think in some ways what happened, the discussion we had today on proactive disclosures again illustrates 
the difficult issues that are that are associated with proactive disclosure, and that's what we're working for. So, we're working through that, we continue to appreciate uh, your patience, and certainly I look forward to being able to close the loop on this. Believe me, more so than anyone, since this was a project that um, we've been spearheading for a long time. But I have another, like a bonus update, and that's on the National FOIA portal. Um, because we're really getting close uh, to being able to go live with our first iteration of the National FOIA portal. So we're obviously really excited. We've worked with lots of people here along the way on development of the features and functionality of the portal. Uh, we're in the final testing and configuration stages right now. Um, and uh, we're really, once we go live with the portal, of course then as people start using it, it will really, really be helpful to us to continue to get feedback, both from agencies who are receiving requests and then, of course, from the requester community on how their experience is in making the request because we, this is definitely something that we view as a, a, a project that will work on a continuum and we want to continue to add features and functionality as, it, as we go along. Thanks. Okay, thanks, Melanie. So I want to um, let folks come up to the mic and um, ask any questions or make any comments. Now is the time. I also need to invite um, my wonderful colleague, Sheila Portanovo, who has been kind enough to be monitoring the live stream. And I know that it's actually been a very busy live streaming day. Folks have been making a lot of comments. Um, Sheila was going to try to summarize um, the, the, the gist of most of them. So yeah, there's no mic. Is there a mic? Okay, so uh, as Alina said, that the live chat has been pretty lively today, and some of the topics that generated the most interest were about the FOIA logs. Commenters wanted people to disclose as much as possible of the FOIA logs, uh, or agencies to disclose as much as possible. Um, regarding the disclosure of government employee contact information, we had comments on both sides of that debate, people who thought that they were in favor of disclosure and as well as not in favor because of security reasons. Um, there was interest in 508 in just the way that it was being discussed and uh, the way that people were analyzing the risks and uh, not the risks of keeping that on the website. And then a lot of comments about people just enjoying watching this meeting and, uh, and hoping to, <laughs> and also enjoying NARA in general and hoping to visit NARA someday. So oh, that's, that's all. They're welcome to come. Thanks, Sheila. Uh, yeah, okay, I'll make one step. Uh, Alex Howard from the Sunlight Foundation. Uh, as one of the commenters on there and someone who shared your live stream, uh, again, we would like to commend uh, the archives both for this and your efforts in open government. Uh, as people can see on your open government plan, um, including the commitment from the EOTIS over the past several years. Um, and indeed, uh, for your FOIA pages, which do in fact list people's names, their phone numbers, and email addresses. Um, and have there been any negative consequences here at NARA for posting that contact information? Not that I know of. We would love to hear about them, because our observation is that doing so saves the public, who this is for, uh, frustration. Um, and uh, our feeling on this count with respect to providing public information for people who are entrusted with providing the public with access to public information should be public. And if these people are subject to phishing attempts uh, or other compromises, then they should be trained and given better tools so that uh, inbound filters that are standard in uh, commerce and the public uh, eye elsewhere are given to them if they are the subject of attempts um, in greater frequency, um, then they should be given better tools. But removing that information from public uh, access, as has happened in certain agencies this past year, is not something that certainly Sunlight supports. As you may be aware, the Energy Department used to have a directory of people on its website, including scientists that members of the public could contact or other people doing research. 
um, enabling better public understanding of publicly produced research, data, other statistics. Certainly we feel it's a best practice for FOIA officers and others to connect the public to these people, not to remove their contact information from public access, as indeed occurred there. We understand these are non-binding recommendations. We also understand in the past these recommendations have not necessarily been given the full attention nor implemented to agencies in the way that any of us would hope. We are extremely excited that you passed forward and moved these forward and hope that they get more attention and we'll be doing what we can to give them that. Um, I'm very grateful that you proactively brought up the issue of this release to one, release to all policy. For those who are unfamiliar, cause of actions, James Valvo and Sunlight <coughs> officially petitioned the White House Office of Management and Budget and the Department of Justice to release the FOIA policy that President Obama, can we say, ordered you to release for one year ago, at the beginning of last year. As of yet, we've received no official response from either the department or the White House, although they have talked to two members of the media who have brought this up. So today, it is great to get that in person, but I would note that our letter and petition has never even been acknowledged from agencies in simply asking you all to put up a policy that we all worked on together. It would be unfortunate if it has to come out and perhaps ironic through a FOIA request or lawsuit. It's exciting to hear that this portal is moving forward and I her certainly hope to see the recommendations that have been brought up here applied there, um, particularly with respect to the FOIA logs that came up here. It's our position that that's something that should be ongoing, not released once a year. And I would note that as we're taking a snapshot of uh, where open government stands in this administration, we have been calling agency FOIA officers this month. And these numbers that have been posted up here are going straight to voicemail. We're not hearing back from them. Our emails and calls regarding open government contacts are being <coughs> ignored or told doesn't, we're not being monitored. Our request for FOIA statistics from last year from the Department of the Interior was met with a instruction to FOIA them. The state of this is not good. And the attention that it is receiving under this administration appears to be one of either uh, benign neglect or even malignant intent. And I'd bring up one specific question that I'd love to hear your opinions on with respect to recommendations. Is it appropriate to assign senior civil servants in agencies to handle FOIA requests and do so in a way that indicates that it is a punishment or a demotion as opposed to someone contributing to efforts to address public requests for public information? And I'm referring here to the State Department. I'm sure you have all seen the reports. You've seen people in government knocking the proud work of FOIA civil servants. And I have not heard a defense of their role or of the law or the responsibilities that everyone has to do it. So I'm curious today if you all would like to comment on that, the role of FOIA, the role of people in your roles. Um, who are doing this work because we're very grateful for it. It's our role as watchdogs, you know, to advocate, to criticize constructively, but we really are grateful for those efforts and we've noticed the void of protection and defense of their role in this administration. And I hope it doesn't continue. Thank you for the opportunity to ask a question and to raise these issues. Thanks. Alex, really appreciate that. Anyone want to react or we'll just let it one, sit one, and digest? Well, one thing that comes to my mind, of, of course, I, Alex knows I'm a proud advocate of FOIA professionals across the government. And um, one of the things that we did that's just very apropos right now, when you were mentioning March, of course, I immediately thought of Sunshine Week and thinking, can we have an advisory committee during Sunshine Week? No, no, we have all our events. And one of the things that DOJ has done for the past couple years is have um, we give out awards during our Sunshine Week events for notable contributions by 
we've had a whole bunch of different categories. New employees working with FOIA teams, uh, lifetime achievement awards. So it's one example of something that we've done um, at my office to help um, re give public recognition to the really hard, difficult work. And I think this committee itself, with all the work and all the discussion, it's very obvious how much we all recognize and appreciate the work that goes into it, into administering the FOIA. Um, so I, I, it's one example, and I know agencies do other other agencies do similar things. Thanks. Um, I'll answer the specific question, um, Nate Jones. So when I read that um, people are going on record to um, prominent newspapers saying that. A FOIA office is a joke, or going to FOIA is like being sent to Siberia, or somehow saying that allowing the public access to information of what the government's doing is not as important as another job. Uh, it made me really angry. Um, and I've been thinking about it and stewing about it, so thanks for the question, Alex. A qu couple of quick thoughts about it is I really would have liked to see um, the FOIA Ombuds Office or Department of Justice go on the record or write an op ed or speak more forcefully saying FOIA professionals are government treasures. Um, maybe it's, maybe you're not allowed to do that. Um, I, I, I wish you were. Um, and if you're not allowed to, I know that Congress is allowed to. So I also was um, upset that no Congress people went on the record. Um, so I guess this is a, a small step in that direction. Two other things that to rather than just kind of defend and um, talk about anger, uh, that can further fix the problem um, that we're working towards, but we have a long way to go, is further instill, I think, two things. Um, I think, one, we have to further instill that FOIA is everyone's responsibility. Um, people, I, I mean, it would have been it would have been good to scold the person saying that it wasn't. Um, and two, I, I think that FOIA professionals need to continue to develop and um, boldly develop an inspector's general mentality. Um, both laws came about at the same time, and I don't think you would ever hear um, someone disparaging an IG's office. Um, and I think that that's something that FOIA officials should uh, aspire to and realize that um, uh, that the freedom of information is a strong law that they can follow no matter what administration is in power. FOIA is the FOIA um, period. Um, I'll leave it at that. Okay, thanks, Nate. Anyone else want to add their thoughts? Okay, anyone on the phone? To the extent anyone has remained on the phone. I'm here, no comment, thank you. Okay. Thanks, Sarah. Okay, um, unless anyone has any other procedural uh, issues that they want to talk about, I think we can wrap this up. Everyone can go to lunch uh, a little bit early. I want to get credit for finishing 12 minutes early. Uh, again, we invite everyone to go to OGIS's website and social media for more information about all the exciting events that happened today. Uh, we are going to have our final meeting on Tuesday, April 17th, right here in the McGowan. Um, and unless there are any questions or concerns, uh, we stand adjourned. Thank you. Thanks, Tom. Really appreciate your time. down.